Hi there, and welcome to another Tech Tips Tuesday. In this episode, we're going to check out choosing the correct capacitor for its intended application. So whether you have an RF circuit, an IF circuit, an audio circuit, or whatever, choosing the correct capacitor is crucial for that circuit's performance, temperature stability, and a whole bunch of other factors. That's what we're going to take a look at in this video. So let's get started. Here are the capacitors that I'm going to be talking about at the whiteboard, not in any specific order. So these first two capacitors here are paper and foil capacitors and they are both faulty by now. So if you have any equipment with these capacitors in them, they've got to go. Now you may have tested these with your capacitance tester and said to yourself, well, they, they test okay. You know, this one reads 104, so that's 0.1 microfarad and this one is 0.05 and it reads absolutely fine. Well, that's not a leakage test. Leakage test is a completely different thing. Now, when people say that these capacitors go leaky, that doesn't mean that they're leaking a, a substance like liquid or anything like that. It just means that they're leaking DC across them. So if you have an old book with yellowing pages in it, chances are that book is pretty old and the paper is going acidic. Now, the same thing is happening inside these capacitors because these capacitors have paper and foil inside them. Now, when the paper goes acidic, it passes DC from one side to the other, and that's a function that these capacitors are not supposed to do. They're only supposed to pass AC and block DC. So these capacitors here, if you want to picture a fault condition, you can put a resistor across this, and that's really what's going on. Now, I know a lot of audio guys seem to like these old Bumblebee capacitors thinking that they make their audio circuits sound better. Well, they didn't sound like that when they came from the factory because they weren't leaky. And really what these things do in an audio amplifier, since they pass DC through, it puts DC voltage, a positive DC voltage on the grid of the next tube, driving it into hard class A. Driving that tube into hard class A causes it to draw excessive current and burns out plate resistors and does all sorts of bad things. In old receivers, these things are responsible for destroying IF transformers and burning out power supplies and doing all sorts of things. So if you have old bumblebees in any of your equipment, be prepared to you know, be repairing the power supply or you know, replacing tubes on a, on a pretty constant basis. These things will red plate final tubes, like the audio output tubes. They uh, put a positive bias on the grids of the, say you had 6L6s, this would put a positive voltage on the grids and cause the 6L6 to red plate, which in turn destroys the tube in short order. Again, through excessive plate current draw, and they even burn out audio output transformers. So these guys have got to go, and usually they get replaced with polypropylene style capacitors like this. All right, the next capacitor we're going to look at here is a mica capacitor, and they are very, very stable capacitors. So they're stable over a very wide temperature range, and you'll find these capacitors in oscillators and precision RF circuits and things like that. Very rarely do these things fail. So if you're tempted to replace these style, this particular style of capacitor, what you want to do first is make sure that it is definitely faulty and that there is some sort of a problem with it. In receivers, many of these capacitors are hand-picked. And if you replace these capacitors, you'll have a real hard time getting the dial accurate again. This capacitor right here is another very dependable capacitor. This is a ceramic style capacitor. Now you never ever want to put this style of capacitor in any kind of oscillator circuit, but these things are very dependable. They never seem to fail. So you'll find these as RF bypassing capacitors. And I'll refer to all this again on the whiteboard. This is a polypropylene style capacitor and these are great in audio amplifiers and they're also very good for RF coupling and things like that. Uh, again, not good for any kind of stability in an RF oscillator or anything like that. This is an NPO style capacitor and these are extremely stable in RF oscillators. They work very, very well and the capacitance moves very, very little with temperature change and that's very crucial in an RF oscillator. So these are very, very accurate. This here is a 1206 part with just some legs soldered onto it so that we can do some experiments later. This is another newer style mica capacitor. So really that's this capacitor in a different style package. That's all this is. These here are orange drop capacitors and these are also newer style capacitors. This is an orange drop and this is a brown drop capacitor, they call them. They are also very, very stable and you'll have absolutely no problems with these things unless of course there's been some form of temperature damage or anything like that. 
This capacitor here is a polystyrene capacitor, and you'll see these things in a lot of the newer uh, solid state equipment. They use them in oscillating circuits and in tuners and all that kind of stuff. These are very, very stable as well, but they're not very good with external temperature, so you can't heat these things up. Polystyrene is very, very soft, and if you heat these things up, the capacitance will change, and when it cools down, it will stay at that, so it kind of has a memory effect. So these should be used in relatively cool circuits. If you're using anything like this in a vacuum tube circuit, you need to use a lot of thermal decoupling and keep these things away from tubes. When you're soldering these things, you don't want to have very much dwell time with your soldering iron on these legs, again, or you'll cause damage to this particular style of capacitor. On the whiteboard here, I've got all sorts of different styles of capacitors listed. What I'm going to do is work down the list here and explain a little bit about each different style of capacitor and I'll give you an idea of the circuits that you'll find these in. I'll also talk a little bit about some of the capacitors on here and tell you what circuits they should be used in and shouldn't be used in. After I'm done explaining what's on the board here, we're going to turn this into usable experience. We're going to go over to the bench and I'm going to demonstrate how the capacitance of these capacitors changes with temperature and we'll also take a look at some vibration and see how the capacitors react to some vibration. Very important to understand if you're designing or repairing any kind of circuitry and you're looking to substitute a capacitor. All right, the first capacitor we're going to talk about here is the NP0 style capacitor. The reason I've got zero in brackets here is because a lot of people say NPO. It's actually NP0 or C0G. And this stands for negative positive zero. And these are extremely stable capacitors. You'll find these capacitors in crystal oscillators, variable frequency oscillators, beat frequency oscillators, and in RF coupling circuits. So basically anywhere you find an NPO capacitor, usually it's RF related, like the circuitry is RF related. All right, so the capacitance movement to temperature is positive negative 0 to 30 parts per million per degree C, and their usable temperature is negative 55 degrees C to positive 125 degrees C, so quite a usable range and very, very stable. The next capacitor down is the mica, and it is also very, very stable. You'll also find it in the same kind of circuits that you find the NPO capacitor. All right. Its accuracy really is positive negative 50 parts per million per degrees C, so not as good as the NPO, but very good. So you'll find you know, these uh, mica capacitors in a lot of older receivers, those domino style capacitors that I talked about, those are mica. And some of the newer style uh, mica capacitors, they almost look like a little brown piece of gum with two legs coming out of them. Those are also a mica style capacitor, and we'll also take a look at some of these over on the bench here, and you'll see what I'm talking about. All right, very, very good for RF service as well. So MICA and NPO are kind of the top of the list for any kind of oscillating circuits or you know any kind of RF circuitry whatsoever. Polystyrene are okay stable and they are temperature, uh, temperature sensitive. So polystyrene caps are those little kind of clear caps and you can see the foil wound inside and the ends kind of look like they've got a pattern on them with two leads sticking out. You'll find them a lot in tuners and uh, solid state equipment. So when I say okay stable, they're not as stable as the NPO or the MICA, but they are very temperature sensitive, and I'm talking about external temperature sensitive. So if you get the actual case of a polystyrene capacitor hot, it will move in capacitance, and then when it cools down, it will stay there. So it will keep moving if you keep getting it hot. So what I'm trying to say is you don't want to tie polystyrene capacitors to any hot tube pins. If you're soldering them, you got to be very, very careful because the soldering iron will, again, change the capacitance a little, and when it cools off, it will stay there. It won't return, all right? So polystyrene caps, again, in a lot of solid state equipment, you very, very rarely find them in anything vacuum tube. And if they are, they have quite a bit of thermal relief and they are far away from the vacuum tubes. These capacitors here are ceramic style capacitors. The X5R, X7R, Y5V, and Z5U are either uh, those disc style capacitors with a leg on each side, or you'll find them as small chip capacitors for surface mount use. Okay, uh, the X is the lower temperature, the 5 is the higher temperature, all right, and the R is the actual usable range. I didn't have enough space to write the usable range in here, but that's really how this coding goes. Now, these capacitors are great for RF bypass. You don't ever want to use them in any oscillator circuits, all right, any kind of tuned circuits. Uh, RF coupling is okay from stage to stage as long as there really is no interlock between the stages. And when I say interlock, one stage will affect the other, all right. So that's really what you want to um, you know, use this particular style of capacitor for. RF bypass, they work absolutely great. I use them for RF bypassing everywhere. All right. 
Polypropylene caps are good for audio and uh, RF stage coupling. They're you know, not very, very stable, nowhere near as stable as anything up here, but um, they are great for audio. Polypro caps, you find them a lot in audio amplifiers and um, in some RF circuits as well, and they are okay for that. No oscillating circuits again, absolutely not. Uh, oscillating circuits are pretty much NPO and mica capacitors, and maybe sometimes polystyrene, all right? Tantalum capacitors are horrible for audio. They're non-linear, but they are great audio or a great RF bypassing capacitors or timing capacitors. So if you're making a circuit with a 555 timer or something like that, and you need some sort of stability, you don't want anything to move around. Tantalums are great because they go above a microfarad quite easily, and uh, they are pretty temperature stable. All right. Paper, again, no good. If you find any paper caps and anything old, uh, you want to get rid of them. Uh, there are some new paper and oil capacitors that are maybe okay. Some of the audio guys really like that kind of stuff. Um, but any kind of old paper capacitor, you want to just get rid of. So whether it's a Bumblebee or a Black Beauty or just a regular you know, foil paper style capacitor in the trash, they go and replace them with a polypropylene style capacitor. And that's really what's on this board here. So what I'm going to do now is take the information that I've shown you here and we'll go over to the bench and I'll demonstrate this with a capacitance meter and oscilloscope and some other tools. What I've got set up here is a mica capacitor in the test leads of my capacitor tester. And this is just a drill vise holding them steady. So this is our little test jig for now. Right here, you'll see a green clip. That's just an attempt to keep noise off the actual drill vise itself. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my hot air tool, all right, and I'm going to heat this thing up. Now I'm not going to take any temperature measurements of the actual capacitor itself. Our temperature measurement for today is screaming hot. So basically, you can picture this thing strapped to the side of a 10 watt resistor. So I'm going to heat this thing up very, very hot, and we're going to see how much it actually moves in capacitance. Now, of course, this is going to get way, way hotter than it would actually get in real service, but still, in a worst case scenario, we can get an idea of how much this mica capacitor is going to move. So I'll move you over here to the capacitor tester. All right, so really all we're going to be paying attention to is, you know, maybe these digits here at maximum. This here is really just, you know, random air current moving over that capacitor at this point and maybe some noise mixed in there as well. So we're at 96.368 picofarad and even if I move my hand close to it, here I'll just put my hand close to it and you can see how much it alters what we're seeing on the capacitor tester here. So when I move the, uh, the actual hot air tool in front of it, you're going to see the digits go all crazy here, but in the end we'll uh, have a, a reading here. So I'll give you an example. I'll turn this thing on right now. So I'll let my, my hot air tool get nice and hot. So we're at 96.36, something like that, picofarad. All right, this hot air tool is already hot enough to melt solder. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to bring the hot air tool close to the actual device under test and I'm gonna heat it up. So we'll keep, a, keep in mind here, 96.36. So here we go. Okay, so that's screaming hot. I moved the tool away, so now we can get an accurate reading. So from 96.36 to 96.5. And as you can see, it's coming down rather quickly. So we had maybe 0.2 of a picofarad movement there. Still 96 point, uh, picofarad. So we haven't even moved one picofarad. That's pretty good. Just turn that off. So maybe 0.2 of movement there. Very, very stable. Excellent for oscillator service, these things. And of course, again, we've made this thing, you know, way hotter than it would actually get in real service here. And as you can see, it's coming down to room temperature and it's coming back. All right, so I'll remove that from the test fixture. Now I'll put this NPO capacitor in here that we looked at on the piece of paper earlier. It's that 1206 part. And I'll just put that in here. Okay. Let everything settle down here for a second. So we're at uh, 101 picofarad, 0.47. Okay, so I'll turn the tool back on here again. And keep in mind when I get the tool close to it, it's gonna get all crazy because of the noise. So 101.47, I'll heat this up. 
and I'll move it away. So I'm on a 1.5. And you can see how quickly that returns. Now that was almost hot enough to desolder the leads off that part. All right, so very, very stable component. Here we go, we're right back at 101.47 again. So extremely stable part, excellent for oscillators. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you the opposite end of the spectrum here. I'll remove this thing and I'll demonstrate just a standard ceramic capacitor like you see right here, all right? Standard ceramic. Okay, so it's in the vise. I got my hands off of it, and you, as you can see, it is still moving, and that's just because the heat of my fingers is settling off now into the test fixture. All right, this is supposed to be 103 or 0.01 microfarad, and we're coming up to that. There we go. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is turn on the tool again. And I'll just swipe this across the face of this capacitor a few times. Now, this would be, oh, equivalent to a Z5U or something like that. Something, uh, yeah, Z5U would be close enough. There is no actual rating on this, so it's probably like a Z5U, Z5V, something like that. Here we go. I'm going to heat this thing up. So now we're at 0 0.002 microfarad, 0 0.003, 0 0.004 as it's cooling down, 0 0.005, and so on. You can see it counting up, 0 0.007, 0 0.008. So now just think if you put one of these ceramic capacitors inside of, a, say, a VFO or any you know sensitive oscillator, that oscillator would move all over the place and it would be uncontrollable. Just even slight chassis temperature changes would cause this thing to move, right? So I'll just touch it with my finger. It's still climbing, okay? That's just holding it with my fingers. Let go of it. Incredible amounts of movement in these ceramic capacitors. So definitely no good for audio as well because they have a thing called the piezoelectric effect and uh, they become quite microphonic in audio service. And I will show you an example of that here. So ceramic capacitors, you know, like this here or the like should not be in any kind of audio signal path. Again, great for, you know, RF decoupling or RF bypass service. But um, even at that, you know, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't try to have this thing in any kind of a, a signal path other than to, you know, drain R after ground, really. All right, so now what I'll do is I'll Put this capacitor in here, it's PolyPro cap, all right. I'll put it in there. This one is rated 0.1 microfarad. Okay, it's in the test fixture. There we go, pretty close. So now what I'm going to do is apply a bit of heat to this. Now you gotta keep in mind that this is a polypropylene cap, so I really don't wanna heat this too hot or I'll damage the unit. But, you know, I'll heat it to the point to where it would, you know, get warm in service. All right, so that would be about the temperature it would get in service. Look at that. No problems at all. As you can see, a lot more stable than the other capacitor. Way, way, way more stable. All right, I can grab it here with my fingers. As you can see, as I put my fingers on it, very stable. That was me moving it in the vise there. Very, very stable capacitors. So great for audio and stuff like that. And that really is the three capacitors of interest here. Actually, I could go grab a tantalum as well. I'll go grab a tantalum and I'll be right back. I have a dipped tantalum capacitor in the vise here. I'm sure we have lots of interesting horror stories about dipped tantalum capacitors. If you got some, let's hear about them. So anyways, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'll heat this and we'll take a look at the Genrad here again. All right, so we're at about 4.7 microfarad and we're not gonna really get too much more particular than that. So, draw all this 
isn't an NPO style capacitor or anything. So I'm heating the tool up here again and I'll run it across here just a couple of times. And that would be blazing hot right now. Well, 4.79, not too bad. Not bad at all. So you can see these are relatively stable. They're good in timing circuits and things like that. Of course, I've heated this thing way hotter than it would ever get in service, but still gives you an idea of how much they really move, especially when they get screaming hot. For this next demonstration, I'm going to use this Tektronix Type 547 oscilloscope with this high gain plug-in. So right now I've got this calibrated to show 500 microvolts per division on the screen. What I'm going to do is take this ceramic capacitor. I'm going to put it on the front here. This is a 0.1 microfarad capacitor. It's a Z5V style. And I'm going to tap it ever so slightly with this insulated rod right here. The noise you see on the screen of the oscilloscope right now is from me. I'm standing about three feet away from the oscilloscope and just that capacitor poking out of the front is acting as an antenna picking me up and a little bit of the tripod and camera as well. So what I'm going to do is touch the face of the oscilloscope and that'll ground my body out a little bit and keep that interference down just a bit. If I was to ground the tripod out, I'd probably almost get a nice clean trace. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to tap this capacitor with this rod and watch what happens on the screen. When you see the trace moving up and down like that, don't pay any attention to that. That's just my hand moving here. That's how sensitive this is. But you'll see another effect here in just a moment. So here I go. See all that there, how it's going below the line? That's creating voltage when I'm tapping this capacitor and that's called the piezoelectric effect. And that's why these capacitors here are absolutely no good in audio amplifiers or in any kind of high vibration atmosphere. So just think if this was in an amplifier on the stage of an auditorium and it was very, very loud and this was leaning up against the chassis and just ever so slightly buzzing, the amount of noise that this would create into the circuit would be absolutely incredible. So from the trace deflected downwards, we had from what I could see about 1.5 to 2 millivolts worth of of uh, you know spikes there. It was exceeding the graticule just a little bit there on one or two of the little bumps. And I'm just ever so slightly tapping that. So it's creating quite a bit of voltage. All right, so what I'll do now is I'll plug in this polypropylene capacitor and we'll see what it does. So again, I'll get rid of some of that hum. Now I'm gonna tap this here. Again, don't pay any attention to that bobbing of the trace that you see there. That's just me moving my hand up and down. So when I'm tapping it, that's just a movement of my hand as you can see. So again, we're just looking for those spikes. So here I go. As you can see, absolutely no spikes there whatsoever. And I'm hitting this actually pretty hard. And that's why polypropylene capacitors are great for audio amplifiers and high vibration atmosphere because they don't have any of that piezoelectric effect. Now again, these other capacitors are great for RF bypassing. These ones here are great for RF bypassing, but in a low vibration environment again. I hope you found the information in this Tech Tips Tuesday useful. If you did, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and hang around. There'll be many more videos just like this in the very near future, touching on all sorts of different topics related to electronics. So until that time, take care. Bye for now.